Good morning, and welcome to our service this fourth Sunday in Advent. I'm glad to see you all here. Please join me in our call to worship. Sing out, my soul. Sing of the holiness of God. Who has delighted in humanity, lifted up the poor, satisfied the hungry, given voice to the silent, and grounded the oppressor? God has blessed the full-bellied with emptiness and given the gift of tears to those who have never wept. God has desired the darkness of the womb and inhabited our flesh. Sing of the longing of God. Sing out, my soul. We begin with lighting our Advent candles this morning. We begin by lighting the candle of hope and the candle of peace, and the candle of love. And we begin this with this reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribe leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to be my shepherd, my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be the prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all your enemies before you. O Holy One, we light this fourth Advent candle. and marvel at your desire to be with us. Let its flames summon hearts grown cold into the warmth of a people living in the light of love. Fill our lives with love, making room there for friends and strangers, all who desire to know you. God with us as we work for justice and peace in the service of hope. God be with us in this light of love. Please join me in our opening prayer. O oh, wondrous God, send your messenger to us today with a word of grace. If we are fearful, move us to confidence. If we are weary, offer us rest. If we are empty, fill us with hope. We have been searching for you far away. Let us find you at home in our midst, changing hearts and minds urging us to join your work of love. We pray this in the name of the one who is coming, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please join me as we come together in unison for our prayer of confession. Do not be afraid, said Gabriel, surprising Mary and confronting her with the decision of her life. Do not be afraid. God is with you. 2020 has confronted many of us with life-changing circumstances and decisions. We know fear from the inside out. In this moment, ponder that fear. Name it, if you can, at least to yourself. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection.
our God, who has been with people since the beginning, is with us now offering grace that is more than we can ask or imagine. God's love frees us from the past and helps us move forward into a new future. Let us thank God with us, Emmanuel, for faithful love. Amen. We come together now to share our joys and concerns with our God. One week left, Lord, just one week left. Can we get all things done that we need to have, that we have set before us? Have all the cards been mailed, the greetings extended, the gatherings coordinated and placed in our calendar for this last big rush before the big day? Have we forgotten anything? Have we forgotten anyone? It would be easy to say we have forgotten the reason for the season, that phrase which is imprinted on keychains and coffee mugs. We think that if we post the note that says Jesus is the reason for the season, we will truly be fulfilling our Christmas commitment. How foolish we are. Placing the words on the wall, taped to a bulletin board, on a refrigerator, does not place the words in our hearts. We replace the glorious story of God's incarnate word with tinsel and wrapping paper and believe that we are ready to celebrate. When will we learn? Come to us now, comforting us, God, with your powerful words of healing. Help us to remember the witness of Mary, a young girl, who never expected to play such a role in salvation history. Put the brakes on our rushing and sit us down to hear the story of your absolute love for us. Get us ready for the birth of your son, who will become our savior. Move us from the focus of our festivities to a focus on witnessing about your love through serving others. Challenge us to reach out to people in need not only with a check to support a particular endeavor, but with actual contact in ministries of sacrifice and service. In such times as this, remind us that we are called to proclaim your love through witness and service. We pray for those who are suffering, for those who are celebrating. Please join me now in a moment of silence as we lift up those names. We pray these prayers in the name of Christ, the one who is coming. Together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 1 through 4 and 19 through 16. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant, David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant, David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name, 
his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And our second reading this morning comes from the gospel, from the gospel attributed to John, the first chapter, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting that might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now, you will continue to see, conceive in your room, womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Shadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her. Who who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 1 through 4 and 19 through 16. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant, David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father my God, and the rock of my salvation. And our second reading this morning comes from the gospel, from the gospel attributed to John, the first chapter, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting that might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will continue to see, conceive in your room, womb and bear a son 
and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Shadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God. Amen. There were once two old farmers. They're neighbors, but they have a feud that's been running for a few years. They haven't even spoken to each other in that time. The whole thing started over a cat. The cat was a stray, but both of these farmers had began feeding the cat and claimed it as their own. From there, everything went downhill. The neighbors quit talking and the grudge escalated to the point that one of them dug a ditch to re-sprout a spring and make sure it divided their properties. One day, a carpenter came through the area looking for work. He knocked on the door of one of the farms and the farmer said, well, if he's going to divide us with that ditch, then I might as well finish the job. I don't even want to have to look across at him. So he asked the carpenter to build a fence all the way across the property, a nice, big, tall fence. The carpenter said, okay, I could do that, but it would take a lot more wood. So the farmer went into town to buy more wood and the carpenter started working with the wood in the shed. That farmer came driving back down the dirt road to his home, but when he looked across the field, he didn't see any fence going up. Instead of the barrier he wanted, he saw the carpenter had built a bridge across the creek. And there, across the bridge, his neighbor came walking toward him with his hand outstretched, a big sheepish grin on his face. You're a brave man, he said. I didn't think you'd want to hear the sound of my voice again. Can you forgive me? The first farmer was surprised as he reached out to shake his neighbor's hand. He found himself saying, Ah, oh, I knew it was your cat. This story is by singer-songwriter David Wilcox, who uses it as an introduction to his song called Fearless Love. The song goes on to weave together another narrative about a church protest and a person caught up in remembering Jesus' teaching to his disciples to love their enemies by using the example of carrying a Roman soldier's pack twice the distance required. The chorus goes, fearless love makes you cross the border. The love that Jesus embodies in our world is indeed fearless love. Besides simply lacking any fear, the love of Jesus defies and overcomes fear. Today, as we continue our journey through Advent, we are focusing on the love that Jesus brought into our world and our lives. We remember that Advent, Advent means coming or arrival, and the season is marked by expectation, waiting, anticipation, and longing. Each week, we are focusing on a different attribute of God represented in the coming of Jesus, hope, peace, joy, and love. As we've journeyed through Advent, we've been looking at different people in the Nativity story. We've dug, dug into the experience or process, usually of one or two individuals, but today I'd like to take a little different approach. 
I'd like to look at all the people in the biblical accounts of Christ's birth. When we do, we realize that the birth of Christ brings together a wide variety of people across many different divides and contrasts. If we walk through the story in order, we start with Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, the old and the young, the prophets and covenants of Israel's past and the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah and the new spiritual future, the separation and death of the past and the restoration and life now present. Then we meet the shepherds and the angels, the beings of earth and of heaven, the physical and the spiritual. And as they head to the stable, there are animals as well as humans, the beings of creation. And here we can look at Matthew's Christmas account and meet the Magi. Who were these mysterious visitors from the East? We're not entirely sure, but we know they followed the star a long distance to find and worship the promised Messiah. Some scholars think they may have been from China. At any rate, whether they are most likely astrologers or some kind of other rulers, the Magi are noble and wealthy men who demonstrate God bridging even more to the divide. The Magi are the esteemed opposite to the lowly shepherds in human social structures. But importantly, they are Gentiles, not Jews, and their inclusion in Jesus' birth story echoes the radical idea that Christ, the Messiah, brings salvation and restoration to all people, not just the Jews. The Magi are also holy men of some sort. They seem to belong to more of a mystical tradition than the Jewish leader structure, but they importantly contrast the spiritual Jew Jewish leaders of the day. There are no Pharisees and Sadducees and spiritual VIPs of the time who are invited to Jesus' birth. Instead, there are these travelers of a different race, who receive an audience with King Herod, albeit with sinister intentions, yet who are willing to disrupt their lives with a great journey and humble themselves to worship the baby of a poor, unassuming couple in the countryside. The cast of characters God assembled for the arrival of his son on earth is far from the expectations any of us would have imagined, and probably even farther from the expectations of the people of that time who lived and breathed within the cultures and its divisions. To us, it may seem like a ragtag bunch. To them, it was downright blasphemous that the Messiah would be so lowly and associated with the full spectrum of unclean humanity and creation. Could Jesus have united any more divisions simply by being born? Hardly. He pretty much covered them all. And in doing so, God revealed several things about his love I'd like to explore today. Christ is love embodied. The Bible talks about love in many places. God is love and the Bible is God's love story for all humanity. From creation, God made people and shared time with them in the garden as companions and children. John the Apostle eloquently describes the love of God in the fourth chapter of 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loves us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, 
if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love of God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. John tells us that God is love. God personifies it. Love is God's nature, and God has shown it to us by sending Jesus. When we come to when it comes to Jesus, giving giving him our lives. We are restored to love. We are fulfilled in love. We live in him and he lives in us. We can count on God's love. It won't let us down. It fills and fuels us. It calls and enables us to love each other. And that brings us to our second part. Love defines and propels us. Jesus brought this reconnection and restoration to love himself when he entered the world. Near the end of his earthly ministry, as he is gathered with his 12 disciples for their last Passover meal together, he tells them, little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I say to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. As Jesus teaches the disciples, he wants to make sure that they love like he does. And here's the most important part. How will people know that they are followers of Jesus? by the love they show to other people. You've heard this before. How will people know that we are Christians? By our love. Love is what defines us. It marks us and characterizes us. At least it should. The church hasn't always done such a great job at this. We as a church body don't always do a great job of this. It's easy for us to point the finger at some pretty big wrongs done by the church throughout history. And we can all probably think of public Christians and churches in our times who make us cringe with anger or embarrassment at their rigid, unloving actions. But we must also look at ourselves too. Of course, none of us is perfect as individuals or the collective church. But each of us can certainly find opportunities in this Christmas season and in our current cultural climate to allow God's love to flow through us to others. On that note, we move to the third part. Love empowers us to cross the borders. These are truly divided times. It seems our culture, our nation, our world, our people, have multiplied the ways to divide us. It seems the us and the thems have been running very high as of late. It's by no means an excuse, but throughout history, our world has been filled with war and plunder and oppression. There have always been the weak and the powerful, the haves and the have-nots. There has just been too much us versus that sins in Jesus' day and even far back in history. Sadly, there still is. It's why Jesus was so radical. It's why God's love is so radical. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus didn't only tear down the walls of division at his birth. He continuously reached out across the chasm of separation and exclusion. He befriended hated tax collectors and even invited one, Matthew, to follow as one of his 12 disciples. He spoke with the Samaritan woman at the well 
which broke a couple of societal taboos at once. Jesus, did, Jews did not associate with Samaritans, and Jewish men especially did not talk to women like this in public. He told his listeners that if a dreaded Roman soldier forced them to carry his pack for a mile, which the soldiers could and did do, to carry it for two miles instead. One of Jesus' most powerful stories about this kind of unexpected love in action is the story of the Good Samaritan. You know how it goes. A traveler was robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. A priest comes along and crossed the road to avoid the bloody scene. An assistant priest did the same. But finally, a Samaritan came along and saw the man and stopped to help him. The Samaritan bandaged the man's wounds, put him on his donkey, and delivered him to an inn where he paid the innkeeper to take care of him until the Samaritan could return. This is a good and challenging story for us today, but it was astounding to, to Jesus' ancient listeners. The Jews hated the Samaritans. Their racism against the Samaritans went back centuries when the kingdom of Israel split. The Samaritans intermarried with foreigners and established their own temple to worship. The Jews considered them an inferior race with a corrupt religion and viewed them with prejudice and disdain. But this is who Jesus was holding up and is an example of loving our neighbor. Jesus was crossing the divide. He reached across the cultural, spiritual, political, and racial, racial divisions, and today calls us to do the same. He was illustrating the kind of love that John describes later in 1 John 4. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Jesus' love is fearless love that calls us and enables us to cross the borders, to tear down the barriers, to reach out above the disagreements. The fear that is driven out by love is the fear within ourselves. Love overcomes the fear of the other who may not look like us or sound like us or share the same perspective and experience as us. Maybe reaching across the divide begins in your family, maybe in your home or your neighborhood or workplace or community. Jesus at Christmas and all the time calls us together in his loving presence and invites us to make room for all, whether we think they deserve to be there or not. There is a humility in love, a willingness to put someone else first. Sometimes love means taking the simple step of building that bridge as a gesture and an invitation. Sometimes it's being willing to listen and not offend. It is always being willing to choose to see someone else, not as other, but as equally loved by God, equally welcomed into God's presence, equally drawn into and propelled out of God's miraculous divine all-consuming love. This is God's love. This is the gift of Christmas. This is the heart of Christmas. As we rapidly approach Christmas Day, I invite and challenge us to rediscover Christmas by rediscovering the overwhelming, all-encompassing, all-welcoming love of God. Where can you build bridges instead of walls this coming week? Amen. I would like to remind you that we are having our Christmas Eve service this Thursday at 7 p.m. So on Christmas Eve at 7 p.m., please feel free to join us. And if you cannot join at 7, join when it is convenient for your family. We have a lot of great special things planned for Christmas Eve. You don't want to miss it. And now let us go forth without fear, 
creating in our lives a space for the one who longs to dwell with us, to share our lives and bless our world and lead us into the kingdom of justice and peace. Amen. It was great to be with you here this morning. I hope to see you all on Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas.